Hello, people of the internet. I'm going to talk to you about Big O, why we care, how it's mathematically defined, and also uh, walk through a simple timing example using the Fibonacci sequence. So as for why we care, the main reason is speed, memory usage, and basically most other things that we want to optimize in a program. You can imagine a program where part of its job is to tell whether or not a word is in a list of words. For example, when you search for a web page, we have to somehow know uh, that a word is in a web page or not. So one approach you can take to that is just looking at every single word one at a time, but that's really slow because if we have twice as many words, now it's going to take about twice as long because I have to look at twice as many words. Uh, similarly, if I had 10 times as many words, it would take 10 times as long. But we can do better than that. So one thing we can do is sort the words ahead of time. And if we do that, then we can take advantage of binary search. The basic idea behind binary search is if I have, say, a million words and uh, I know that they're sorted, then I know that it's somewhere between word zero and word a million minus one. So I can check the middle. And if I'm looking for a word like cantaloupe, but the word in the middle is melon, then I know that if melon is right here, I don't have to care about everything past melon. If this represented all my words from zero to a million, I can just check right in the middle. And if this is melon, but I'm looking for cantaloupe, I know that I can completely ignore this whole side. Similarly, I can repeat that step. And if this word happens to be banana, I know I can ignore the left side. And every time I take a step, every step of this algorithm, I cut the number of words in half. And that's why the running time, the amount of time that it takes for binary search is on the order of log base two of n. As a simplification though, we usually just say that the big O or the, the running time for binary search is on the order of log of n because log base two of n is really just some constant times log of n. We don't really care about the constant. We don't really care about how long each step is. We mostly care about how many more steps there are to do as the size of the input grows. Uh, in this case, as the number of words doubles, we only add one extra step. And as you can imagine, for a large company that's processing a lot of data, even if they're able to process, say, a million words very, very quickly, if doubling the number of words meant that it would take twice as long, that just wouldn't be very good. So now let's move on to how Big O is actually defined mathematically. The first thing to know is that Big O is not just defined in terms of how fast a program takes to run. It's really a bound of sorts on any function. It gives you a sort of limit, not a mathematical limit, but a sort of limit on how quickly a function can grow in the worst case. As a concrete example, let's think about how long it takes for a search where we just look at each word one at a time. And let's always assume that we get really unlucky, that the word we're looking for is always at the end of the list or maybe just missing completely. So in that scenario, if I have n words to look through, I basically have to do n steps. I have to look at each word one step n times. So that would look something like this. Maybe there's a little bit of overhead in this function that always takes a small amount of time, but all that would do is shift this up slightly. If every step took twice as long, all that would do is take this graph and basically multiply it by a constant. So instead of something like this, we'd have something like this. But in both cases, you can see that they're, they're just lines. And for both of these cases, we would say that they're on the order of n, that they're big O of n because they don't grow any more than n times some constant. It's common notation in programming to call the amount of time a function takes a t of n, where n is the size of the input. In our searching example, n would just be the number of words that we have to look through. So the way that we say that the amount of time something takes is on the uh, order of g of n, where 
g of n can be any function like n or log base 2 of n, n squared, anything you can think of, is just to say that t of n is O of g of n. And all this means is that for some constant, little c and big N, t of n is less than or equal to that constant times g of n. And we also add in this extra bit that this is true for all little n greater than big N. So if I were to draw this out just to give you a real idea, imagine the linear search that has a little bit of overhead in the beginning. And what I mean by a little bit of overhead is that even if you're not processing that many words, there's some amount of time just to use the function. Now let's contrast this with what n looks like. n might just look like this. And at first thought you might think, hey, t of n doesn't look like it's o of n. It looks like it's bigger. But that's why we have these constants, uh, little c and big N. And they kind of represent two ideas. The idea behind this constant is that we don't care how long each step takes, we just care how much longer it takes as the size of the input grows. And since c is a constant that doesn't depend on n, it doesn't really change how things grow, it just changes how much time each step takes. So for example, if this is n and we chose c to be 2, then this would just double. And now it's pretty clear that even though t of n starts out bigger than some constant times n, after some point, t of n is always less than or equal to it. And that's where big N comes in. It's basically the point at which you see that crossover. And in order for t of n to be O of g of n, you have to make sure that after some point, t of n is always smaller or the same. So now that we have this formal mathematical concept, let's actually try to apply it and prove that a simple linear search really is uh, O of n, not just with graphs, but with actual math. If you have a for loop that's looking at each word one at a time, then we know that there are going to be at least n steps, one step for every word. And there also might be some steps up front. For example, if I have a for loop that's using an index to look at each word, then there's a small amount of time that it takes just to set that index equal to zero or to check that that index isn't going beyond my number of words. For simplicity, let's just say that that's 100 steps, which is probably much more than it is, but we don't really care how long each step takes. Let's just say that there's 100. So in that scenario, t of n is just 100 plus n, and we want to prove that t of n is O of n. Based on our definition here, we can actually fill, start filling some stuff in. First, we'll replace g of n with n, and then we'll replace t of n with 100 plus n. So now the tricky part is actually simplifying this and proving that it's true. Usually what you want to do is try to get all of the n terms on one side or other of the equation. After getting all of the n's to one side of the equation, it becomes pretty obvious that 1 is going to be less than or equal to some constant that we get to choose minus 100 over n because as n gets bigger, this term of 100 over n is only going to get smaller. In fact, if we just choose that uh, big N is going to be 1, then little n is always going to be 1, which means that this term is always going to be either 100 or smaller than 100. Since this term of 100 divided by n is always going to be equal to 100 or an even smaller number, by proving that 1 is less than or equal to c minus 100, we also prove that 1 is less than or equal to c minus 100 divided by n because we've already decided that n is going to be greater than or equal to 1. So this term right here of c minus 100 is strictly greater. So by choosing a value of n and c, we can prove that as long as c is greater than or equal to 101 and big N is greater than or equal to 1, then this equation is always satisfied, which means this is satisfied, which means this is satisfied, which means that t of n is o of n. Note that if we wanted to take some extra steps, we'd actually be able to find a c that always works for an n that we choose or vice versa. So now I wanna talk about the timing example. So we're gonna look at some actual C++ code that calculates the Fibonacci sequence. 
And if you're not familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, that's okay. The Fibonacci sequence is defined like this. The first two numbers in the sequence are just one, and then every number after that is just the two previous numbers added together. And you might be wondering why I'm using the Fibonacci sequence. Mostly because it's really easy to write demos with, and it's relatively simple to understand compared to a real life example. Accurately benchmarking code, or trying to figure out how long it usually takes to run, is actually a really, really hard problem, especially because every computer will give you different results, and depending on what other programs are running at the same time, you'll get different results, as well as all kinds of other factors that I'm not gonna cover in this video. Depending on how you implement a function to calculate those Fibonacci numbers, you'll get really different results and timing. Often, the function that is slow at the start will end up being much, much faster as the difficulty of the problem grows or as the size of the input grows. So now I'm gonna walk through this code section by section. Uh, first, we have the includes to include things like C++'s time library called Chrono, a library for math, doing basic operations like parsing numbers, and then uh, C's standard in and standard output. Um, you could use IO stream, but I like the formatting of printf better. So the first thing we do is implement a simple timer. Now, timing things is really, really difficult, and you might think that the best way to time something is just to check you know, what time it is on the clock right now and then check later, but this has some problems. The recommended way, <clears throat> sorry, but this has some problems. So instead, we're gonna use steady clock, which is basically guaranteed to always increase in time. Even if somebody tries to change the time of their clock, this one is always going to do the correct thing. And it just works by using two simple methods. One to start the timer, which just looks at what time it is now. And then another method that tells you how many seconds have passed uh, since the start. The next step are the three different ways that we actually implement our Fibonacci function. The first one is a recursive solution that's basically based on the mathematical definition. If n is small, we just return one, if, like if n is either zero or one, and otherwise we just add up the two previous ones. The problem with this is that it's exponential. If I try to calculate something like the fifth Fibonacci number, then I start out like this. In order to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number, first I have to calculate the fourth Fibonacci number and the third Fibonacci number. So first I calculate the fourth one. But then this Fibonacci calculation has to calculate the third and second Fibonacci number. And the third Fibonacci number here has to do the same thing all over again. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of duplicate work here. In fact, the third Fibonacci number is calculated in two different places. And because we're not doing anything in the code to actually remember what the third Fibonacci number is, all of that extra work is just extra work for really no benefit. So one cool thing about calculating the Fibonacci numbers this way is that it's so amazingly slow. In fact, if you look at the number of times I have to go down or the number of branches I have to take, that basically corresponds to the number of steps that I have to do in order to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number. And if I were to go calculate the sixth Fibonacci number, I would essentially have to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number all over again, as well as the fourth Fibonacci number all over again. So I almost double the amount of branches that I have to take or the amount of steps that I have to take in order to calculate the next Fibonacci number. The next one we look at tries to remember all the work that it did. So we start off with these first few uh, Fibonacci numbers. And then what we do is we just loop n times. And the idea behind this code is that first we calculate the next Fibonacci number, and then we update just to make sure that, you know, our F0, or in this case, the Fibonacci number from two numbers ago gets updated and the Fibonacci number from one number ago also gets updated. So in other words, F2 is always going to be the nth Fibonacci number, F1 is gonna always be the n minus one-th Fibonacci number, and F0 is always gonna be the n minus two Fibonacci number. And this one is linear. Even though we have some steps here, a lot of these steps only happen exactly one time. 
These steps in the loop happen multiple times, but we know that they happen roughly n times. So the total number of steps for this version of the Fibonacci function is just 5 times n plus 9. Now, we don't know which of these steps actually take more or less time, but it's actually not super important. The important thing is that this is roughly how much it grows. And this is linear, or O of n. The last version of the Fibonacci function that we have here is always going to take a constant number of steps, which makes it O of 1, but it's also one of the most complicated and hard to understand ones. This also just goes to show that oftentimes when you make something much faster, the code also gets more complicated. So there's actually a trade-off there between code that is easy to read and understand and speed. That's not always the case, but it happens quite a lot. The last couple bits here are a nice convenience function that runs code for us, and then lastly, the actual main function that runs all of this, times how long each one takes, and outputs it in a nice format. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the rest of the code, but the short version is it's going to run each of those Fibonacci functions, giving it larger and larger n. So we calculate the first Fibonacci number, the second Fibonacci number, and then the 10th and the 20th and the 100th and so on. And we're going to see roughly how long each one takes. So now I'm going to compile and run the code and we'll see what happens. One of the really interesting things to note is that at the start, when we're calculating really small Fibonacci numbers, the recursive version is the fastest. And then the second fastest one is the loop. And then the slowest one by far is the math one. And this is kind of the exact opposite of what we expected. I had just said that the math one always takes a constant number of steps, so it should be faster. And similarly with the loop one, the loop one always takes some linear number of steps. If I calculate the 10th Fibonacci number uh, compared to, say, the second Fibonacci number, it should take about five times as long. And with the recursive one, it should get much, much slower as time goes on. If we actually look at the numbers, that is, in fact, exactly what happens. Initially, the math one is the slowest, but eventually, right towards the end, it eventually becomes the fastest of them all. Similarly, once we start calculating around the 35th Fibonacci number, the loop version uh, is still relatively fast compared to the recursive version. In every step of the recursive version, it almost looks like we're taking 10 or 5 times as long, while the loop one just steadily increases in how much time it takes. So this is just an example to show you that you should care about big O, because when you're dealing with really large inputs, if you're just focused on the raw speed, if you're just focused on how fast you can process, say, 1 million words, then your function might actually be really slow when you have to process, say, a billion words. And that's it. If you liked the video, please subscribe and see you later.